Hi everyone, in this video, I would like to share with you how to create automated reports using R. I know I had done a similar video. In this case, however, I would like to share with you how to take a database and create an automated report using R and R Studio specifically. I just want to warn, however, that this is not for beginners because it does involve some trickery with LaTeX, the typesetting language. And before creating this video, I spent hours just struggling with getting the right libraries. So now I have all the code set up, but you may face difficulties when you are trying to this, do this on your own. So before you get started, make sure that you test your R Studio environment, make sure all your libraries are up to date, make sure your R is up to date, make sure you have LaTeX typesetting installed. If you are using Windows, then make sure that you have MicTech. If you have Mac, then MacTech is recommended. And you may want to test them in really a simple, minimal example using a typesetting program like a tech maker or just try creating a markdown document and try uh, adding some latex commands to it maybe i'll think of adding another video to this so that you can see what i mean but i'm assuming that you have all these installed and i will add the description add links to the description for this video so that you know which libraries i'm talking about but let's get started for this video, I am looking into the Northwind database that Microsoft provides with its access and database and SQL Server database. So somebody, luckily for us, also made a SQLite database of the same tables, which we will use. I already, so I went to this URL, downloaded that SQLite database and put it in this data folder and I'm going to connect it to that SQL like database. So I would recommend, again, I will add this link to the description so that you can also download the database and be able to connect to, uh, to it using R. So let's get started. First of all, I created an RMD document. I went to file new and a markdown, doc, markdown document. Then I added the title. I said Northwind traders. Output is Beamer presentation, which is a LaTeX. It's kind of old school, but that's how LaTeX presentations were created using this Beamer template. I'm saying TOC equal to false. So I don't want a table of content on this one, table of contents. I'm keeping the tech file, which is generated when you have LaTeX code in your, in your markdown documents just to debug and to see if there were any errors. I'm using LaTeX engine as this X, XE LaTeX. It just gives me more flexibility in terms of specific font types that I want to use. Then I added this another argument where I'm saying in, includes this in header. So it will, it will add this header to every child document that I may have. And I can show you what that looks like. It's right here and now uh, be prepared to see the markup language of LaTeX so you don't have to worry too much about this because it's just some shortcuts commands that I want to use in the individual documents you can just essentially copy and paste this whole into your document but just to go line by line we'll go over this as this one I commented and Stack Overflow is pretty useful because you can copy lots of different code from uh, different questions people have. So in this case, I want I don't want the navigation symbols. So by default, Beamer templates create navigation symbols. We don't want those, so we are removing those. This book tabs creates really nice looking tables in LaTeX. Graphics is another package that LaTeX uses to include to include uh, images and PDFs. Then I'm using this theme called Metropolis. It's part of the Beamer package. It looks nice. 
I also have the Open Sans fault, uh, font type from Google, Google font types. I downloaded that and I'm setting it to be my default font type for this document. Then I most likely I copied this from somewhere to, to add the proper title up at the top and making sure that it shows properly. Then the last one is array package. This helps us create different columns and gives us more control on the document. So let's go back to our master document. I named it master because it's, this, is, this contains all the code that we need to see to be able to create our report. And the last option is, again, I found the Stack Overflow thread about this. By default, Beamer creates four by three documents with the aspect ratio four by three, but 16 by nine gives us more space and it looks better. So let's get into the, so this is the whole, I forget what it's called, the uh, YAML values to, so that uh, Knitter that our studio uses knows what to do with those things. So we set all these things up now we are going to get into some fun part of actually looking at the R code. So I set up a R chunk, I'm just calling a setup. I'm saying include equal to false because I don't want this code to actually show up in the document. I'm just setting up all the things that I want to be able to do for this document. So I'm saying don't, don't show this code. Don't show any warnings, message equal to false. I don't want to see any messages. This last one is since we are changing the font type, by default, when you change the font type, only the LaTeX document will, or the Markdown document will change its font type, but the figures that are created, so the plots that are created using ggplot, those won't be changed. So we are using this fig.showText equal to true to make sure that the font type changes on the ggplot plots also. I added this option, as I said earlier, I was facing all sorts of challenges with LaTeX, and this tiny text. So I wanted to make sure that I am able to find out where the errors are. So this is on you, his website, where he says you should add this. I couldn't see where the errors were generating from. You don't have to keep this in your code. Then we are loading our favorite libraries, tidyverse, to get all the dplyr, stringer, and various other libraries that we will be using in this code knitter to again knit this document into f using xc latex and latex cable extra to make pretty tables which is actually a pretty cool library they have all sorts of examples on their website you should go and check for pdf and html lubricate just to modify the dates and i don't think i'm using that much but it's useful scales is to add labels different labels and creating our own scales for different plots as well as it has some static functions that you can use like percent dollar comma and i think i'm using that for one of the plots and this is the library we saw here fig dot show text so this library allows us to use any font type that's installed on your machine I'm saying font.add open sans and I'm giving the path to the to the font file. And then once you say show text.auto, it, it will automatically show with the font that you had selected in every every chart. So you don't have to keep adding that to every every ggplot command. So here is what we said earlier, the SQLite database. Let's just see what it has. So here is the GitHub for this, and you can see here's the database, Northwind small dot SQLite, and you can download this. It also shows you the entity relationship diagram between different tables, how they are connected, what the primary keys are. I think access used to come with this, but I'm not so sure. But anyway, thank you, JP White, for creating this for us. So here are some commands. So this DBI package, let's just see. Uh, let's go to packages and say DBI. So DBI, as the description says, it allows us to connect to different relationship, relational database management systems. And it's pretty cool. So we are going to use, I'm not loading it. I don't know why I'm doing it this way, but this is a shortcut. If you don't want to load the library, you can use the package name and two colons to still use the functions from that library without loading that library. 
So here's what I'm doing is I'm using this function db connect and we can see what this function does. So essentially you are just giving it the driver and if any authentication, password, username is needed, you give that and it connects easily. Again, if everything is set up properly, you will typically won't have any problems. If you run into problems, then that's when you start spending lots of time fine figuring out what's happening. Oh, so let me just load all of these so that we can concurrently run this. It's showing me something. We're going to ignore that. All right, so here's the driver. We are saying connected to SQLite, and here's the database name. I stored it in the in the data folder. I created another folder called data and I stored it. And let's see if we can execute this. So it looks like it worked and you can see it says formal class SQL like connection. Now this command lets us see what all tables this connection has. So I'm going to paste this here and you can see all these tables that uh, we saw on the GitHub category, customer, product, order, detail, employee, so on and so forth. You can also chain in some of the deep layer commands and see what that table actually has. So I selected this employee table and it has this notes column. So I'm saying, show me the top six rows from this table. And here it is. So it, it has connected to the table you can now run any SQL command on this or you can use deep layer commands. But I prepared this long SQL. It may not make sense in terms of what it's pulling, but using that entity relationship diagram, again on that GitHub page, I was able to string this together and joining the product to category, to order detail, to the order, customer and employee, to see who which employee sold that product which customers bought it, what was the volume, and when was it bought, and so on and so forth. So I'm saying this connection, chaining it to the stable SQL command, and I'm saying collect this into this NW data underscore data data frame. So let's see what happens when we run it. So now you'll see it created this data frame, if I expand it, we'll see all the, the, all the columns that we selected in the SQL are here. Let's see what that NW data, data frame looks like. So I'm going to type glimpse and the tape. So you got all these different columns that I had selected. You can see it has employee name, category name, product name, order date, and so on and so forth. I noticed that the order dates didn't come as a date, so I am changing using the mutate command from dplyr to change the order date and put it in this format because that's what the format looks like, year, month, and day. So let's execute that. Let's check it again. And now you can see the order date is in date format. I also wanted to see how many categories this category column has from this data frame because that's the category is what we are going to use to create a report to show the top products in that category, top employees who sold that product, uh, top customers, as well as some profit ratios, some calculations that I created. So I wanna make sure that we know how many categories are there that we will use to create that report. So let's see how many we have. So we have eight categories and beverages, condiments, and some has some categories have more products in them, some don't. But for this example, I think this is pretty good. I created this function. It's pretty long. You can see to create a heat map, I want to add a heat map to our report to to show which months had months and years had not years sorry i take it back only months which months had higher sales 
So we created this function and again, most likely I copied this from somewhere, but let's just walk through this. Uh, I'm passing all these values. I'm passing the data frame, X variable, which variable we want to use to create the calendar, uh, which variable has the year value, which variable will be used to fill the colors and the format of it and the title. So I'm creating a ggplot, taking the data frame, and you have to use the AES underscore string if you're passing values using a string. So it, it, it doesn't think that this actually x var actually exists in this data frame, but it knows that this is a string and it's trying to extract the variable that is in that string. So this is pretty simple. We're just saying create a ggplot. Here are the x variable, here's the y variable is the fill color then we are adding title we are saying it should be white uh, that sorry not title but tile the tiles the tiles themselves should be uh, the border color should be white we don't want to see that and we are filling it with gradient from orange to dark red and we are saying we just need three breaks which are pretty breaks so the breaks would look natural and will look good we don't want scientific notation on that. And you'll see we passed this comma format. So this is the scales library. We are saying, uh, let's just take an example. So scales, I think we already have that. So if we if we had comma and we said 10,000, you'll see it added the comma uh, US, US, notif uh, US way of doing it at least. Same thing if you had dollar, it will add the dollar symbol and comma at the thousandths place. So we are passing that here. We are also making, uh, getting rid of everything else. We are just making it a black and white, black and white theme and making some certain changes. We are getting rid of the tick marks. We are putting the legend on the top. We are removing the panel border. We don't want any grid lines. We also remove the key. We don't want the key. We added some margin to the legend and added some plot margin also we removed the access title we removed the we made the legend text slightly bigger and added making the x-axis text and added some margin to it i'm sure i arrived at all these things after playing with them for a long time just to make it look pretty but I don't think for this exercise it's as important as knowing how to actually put all this together and create your report. But you'll see through this that there is there is purpose behind going through all of these things. Then at the end, once we have our this G object with all these things, now we are saying that for the X axis, make the breaks from one to 12 for 12 months. Labels should be, uh, this month abbreviation is a stored variable in R and you'll see it has these abbreviations, January, February. And removing again, I think some margin, making a zero, zero. This is adding uh, scale Y reverse, will reverse as it says, it reverses the scale that you have for uh, your continuous axis, because if you want the maximum at the top, by default, max, you'll see maximum on the top, but now in this case, I'm, sh I'm saying I want it slightly different. Some other changes to the legend. I think I wanted the specific look or maybe even the code I copied had this already. So this is the function that will create a heat map based for every month and it will make the color denser, darker if, if it has seen more of whatever value we fed it to. So if it's sales, it will make that block, that tile darker please note that this is all part of our master rmd document so when we knit this document it's going to go through all of this and run it's just going to create that function and we are going to use this function in another document so this is what we had so far we got the data made some changes to the date format created a function to create a heat map which is for a calendar and this last piece in here we are saying again include equal to false we don't want this code to be shown on our slides 
but uh, you can see some of the Stack Overflow links, how to do this. This knitter library is pretty nifty. It comes with this knit child function. So we can actually see what this function is. And it is as we would expect. It knits a child document and returns a character string that we can feed into another document. And it has some options, but we don't need to use it. First, we define this out equal to null. So I just defined a variable which doesn't have any value. We are just saying, just define a variable null. Then I created this for loop. I'm saying for i n one to two. So it's just going to run it twice. And c is for concatenation. So I'm concatenating the out variable, which in the first round would not have anything. And join that with this knitter child object, which we created a child report rmd file which we'll see in a second and do that twice because it's a loop for two iterations and once it's done it will create this out object and then we ran this inline command in r so rmd will look at this r command and run it so we are saying essentially paste this out object with collapse saying by a new line so enter a new line between whatever elements you see in two objects. Let's just see quickly what this, let's just quickly see how this paste and collapse argument works. So I'm selecting the first three letters from this letters vector. If I don't put any anything and let's just run this, let's see what happened. Actually it didn't do anything, it just repeated those as is. But if you were to say collapse and add a new line, it's actually going to create one string and separate the letters by a new line. So you can see that's how it is. Uh, and then if you do a cat on it, which is how it should get printed, you will see they are appearing on three different lines. We are knitting it into a child, uh, knitting the child document, putting that back into one variable, and then running this inline command to see all the child documents put together. Now see the child document. This child document is where all the magic is happening. This is where we are saying what our document should look like. And I'm sure when you're looking at this without seeing what the output I have, this might be confusing. But how I went about this is Beamer class document for a presentation offers this columns, I don't know what to say, a function or a functionality where you can divide a slide into n number. This columns functionality offers us a way to divide the slides into equal number of columns. I wanted this slide to have two rows and three columns. So six boxes essentially where I could fit information in each of those boxes for each of the categories. We'll run these calculations through a loop so that for every category, these things are calculated and they get fit into each of those boxes. This is what I mean. So first thing what I'm doing here is I have this R chunk where I'm saying echo equal to false. So I don't want the code to be repeated, but I want the output to be shown. So the first thing we are doing is the category count which we knew how many categories were there. Oh, it cannot be found. Oh, because I didn't save it. But this is the cat count. Again, category counts has how many rows each category has and the category name. And what I'm doing here is, you'll remember in our loop here, we are passing this i value to this loop. So knitter magically is passing this i value to this child object. So this i is pretty important because that's what we are using here. We are saying filter the cat count data frame where the row number is equal to i, which is in the first iteration, it will be one. And we are saying only return us the category name and as a character. Let's see this one by one. So let's filter this first of all. 
So when you do this, obviously you'll get an error because you don't know what i is, object not found, but let's just make that equal to one. So this is what we got. We got the full data frame, but we don't want the whole data frame because we just want the value from the first row, which is beverages. Then we are saying, using the select command, we are saying our select function, we are saying only give us the category name column. We don't want other things. So I'm going to make this one again. So now you'll see it return only the first column, but it's still a data frame because if you do str on this, you'll see it's a data frame, yeah, table, deep layer format, but it's still a data frame. And now I'm saying only the first column value, I am not interested in the, the whole, I just want the value. So I'm converting into as character. Need to make this one. So now you'll see it's in quotation marks. So we know this is the value we want to use. So this is going to drive a lot of things in this loop. First of all, we are going to use this as our slide title so we know which category we are looking at and again this this is just an example obviously you can use this for your data set and you can create reports breaking it down by whichever category whichever breakdown variable you want to use then what we are doing is i'm saying okay now i found my category which category i want to use i gave this name cat underscore loop name and I'm filtering the whole that NW data for that category. So let's see what happens. Oh, so we can actually execute this. Oh, yeah, it doesn't know the I, I keep forgetting. But let's give it a name and change this to one. And see what it should have beverages in it, yeah. So now we are saying, well, my data set should be filtered for beverages. So we're getting, we're getting all these three, all these 389 rows and eight columns from our NW underscore data, data frame filtered for beverages. Now we are using, if you look at this, it's blue in color, it's highlighted because it's an RMD document. Now we are using markdown syntax. So if you have one pound, that means it's the, the topmost header for your document. So if it's an article in Markdown, that will be the, the section header. In this case, it's the slide header. And we are using this inline uh, command, essentially, and saying, just print this cat loop name in the first header. So this will print that value in the slide header. And this is what we uh, discussed earlier, the columns. So this columns functionality rather in, uh, in Beamer class lets us create equal number of columns. And the way I'm doing it is we start this. And if you, again, if you don't know the LaTeX markup, you will have to spend some time to see how it works, but it's pretty similar to HTML. It starts with begin columns and it will end with end columns. So it has to have a matching ending. And this T is saying top align all of those columns. And as we said earlier, we want three columns. So I'm saying that the first column should be 30% of the text width that it has available. So whatever the page width is, is going to pick 30% of that. So that's for my first column. Here's the second column. And here's the third column. So three columns with 30% of the width and why 30%? Because we want some white space in between those. When I had it at 33%, I didn't have any white space between those columns and tables. So the first column be our top left corner of the PDF or the Beamer presentation. We are saying we want to see top products and skip size is the command which is making the font size slightly smaller. What do we want to see here in that? We want to see the top products that are sold by quantity. So our data, did we save this as data? Let's save this. Our data, data frame has all the data for the beverages category. 389 rows and eight columns. 
now we are saying okay what out of for this category can you show me the top five products in this category that were sold the most so the way to do it is use this arrange function from dplyr and we are saying arrange it or sort it by quantity head equal to n equal to five so only shows the top five then we use the select command just to select those two uh, columns that we want to see i'm just renaming this product name equal to product for just better legibility and quantity column then for some reason we have to sort it again because when you do select i think it loses its sort so we have to sort it again and here's the so this link is goes to that cable extra package which is amazing it lets you create very beautiful looking tables it has row highlighting column highlighting you can even provide some specifications how your column should look and what the uh, alignment should be and how much space they should take uh, take i have turned off the full width i uh, right now i think it's taking the full width and i want to make sure that the first column has enough space so that it can fit in without uh, wrapping the text so we can actually run this and see what it looks like so it's essentially taking that table and converting into a latex table format with proper uh, rules and everything so this is what it looks like so this begin tabular and top rule and all of the these values those are the latex commands to create a, a table but we don't have to do this manually this cable command from knitter takes care of it and cable extra gives us some more variety since we set the font size to be small now we are setting it to back to normal is this is just a precautionary step i don't think we have to do it once we if we want everything to be small then we can just set it but since there oh yeah i understand why we have it because we have this another label top customer that we want to be shown in the normal font size so we have to do it normal size so just like how we did with the begin columns we are closing this column begin column and column and this is again the top left corner of our slide again imagine a table with two rows and three columns this is the first box where we will have top products then the second box the middle 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 column in the top row we want to see who the top customers are so just like how we did for the products we will do the same thing for customers so we are arranging the data sorting it by quantity seeing the top five and again using the select function to change the name of this this uh, column to contact name quantity sorting book tabs same exact thing what we had here if we except we want to see the contact names this is what it is it's showing us and again this may not make a whole lot of sense what uh, calculations we are doing here if i knew what the data set actually was we could do this but this is an example we're just trying to put some data into those placeholders and you'll see this is in the r tag so we are whatever the output of this would be the rmd file will take it as 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 is and uh, execute that even here we don't have any other special clauses it's just going to take this as is and turn it into a nice looking pdf so this is the, the second box in the first row now we are going to the last box in the first row here we are trying to see who are the employees who sold these quantities exactly the uh, same like the first two and we change the name to employee we're going to copy paste and see what that is so again kind of the same table the quantity is same, the same for all of them because that's the column we are using to sort showing the top employees we are going back to the normal size again once we made the table small and we are closing the first row then i added some space between the first row and the second row using this v space command then similarly what we had up at the top we are going to do the begin columns and end columns again we'll see three begin column for each of the boxes and width 
30% text width, just like what we had earlier. Now in this, the second row first box, I want to see monthly sales. This is the calendar heat map that function we had created. And I had to specify some other extra parameters here just to make sure that it fits properly. So I specified the, the width of the plot, height of the plot, and how much space the plot should take once it's generated. We are, so here we are looking at, uh, so since we had the order date as a date, we are using this month function from library date to convert this into a number year or not, a, yeah, extracting the month and converting into a number and extracting the year from the date. Then we are grouping it by year and month and we are looking at the uh, monthly sales. So it's quantity by unit price and the function that we had, the my calendar heat map, we are passing the data frame. This dot means since we are in a chain, it's going to pass whatever happened before that, before this command. So this data frame, let's just see what that looks like. We extracted the month, we extracted the year, then we are grouping it by year and month, and we are calculating monthly sales. And this is what it looks like. So here's 2012, 13 month and monthly sales. Then we are passing all of this to this, my, uh, my calendar heat map function with all these things that we saw. I want to see order month on the X axis. I want to see order year on the Y axis and fill it with monthly sales. So again, it will make it darker if the sales were higher and lighter if the sales were lower. And I want the format to be dollar. So we can actually even run this and see what it looks like. Ah, we didn't save the my calendar heat map function. We can fix that. Go here. And then try the previous thing. And you can see it here. It created this heat map. Uh, looks like February 2014 had the highest number of sales for this category, which was beverages. And you can see February of 2013 didn't have that many sales. There's some explaining to do there, but this is what it's doing. It is passing them. Then we also added some other theme elements just to make it look better. Uh, we changed the, the y-axis y-axis text to make it little, uh, make it bigger. X made it bold and removed the or actually filled it with the background with gray color and as well as the plot background. So we can actually run this whole thing. See what happens. So slightly different from what we had the previous plot, but it just made those tiny adjustments. So this is the first box in the second row. It's going to put this heat map in there. In the second box, the middle column for second row, we want to see top products by quantity. And this is just some silly calculations I, calculation I created. Again, I am passing these parameters to make sure that it fits in all of, all of the space that we have. We are grouping data by product name. We are summing the, sale, uh, the quantity, how many products were sold, then sorting it picking the top five and reordering them by quantity and creating a bar graph. So essentially it's showing the bar graph of the top five products. So just like previously, we can run this and see what happens. So this is what we see. So here are the names of those products and the quantity that it was, that it was sold for. And similarly to what we have here, I made some changes to the, the theme changing the background color, panel, title, and so on and so forth. So this is what it would look like. So I added the grid line, made this left aligned, and made this bold. So that's the second box of the second row. And this is the last, last box. Here we are going to see product products by sales. 
we are looking at the product name now the unit price the, uh, arranging it by the sales so top five products that were that is the highest number highest amount of sales and similarly what we did earlier we are plotting it changing these parameters and seeing uh, so let's see what that plot looks like so you can see this Hoite de Blay sold for more than looks like five thousand dollars and then the next one was coffee which was less than or slightly over thousand dollars so this is kind of the data we are trying to see in this document to recap what are we seeing so we have six boxes two rows three columns first box is showing top products just a table second box the middle column first row we are seeing the top customers the last box first row we are seeing the top employees and the bottom row, we are only seeing charts, monthly sales as a calendar heat map, products by quantity, and products by sales. And if everything goes smoothly, when we run this master RMD, again, just to uh, remind us, we are knitting this, this child document, we are passing this I've iterator so it's just selecting one row at a time from the data set that we have and it's going to knit this child so create all these six elements for each of the category and paste it back into this out variable and at the end we use this inline command to paste all of it out so here is our moment of truth will all of this work well it will because I spend many hours making sure that it works uh, so let's see to knit all of this together all you have to do is just hit this knit command and you'll start seeing that it's so here you will see it's processing the child document for the first category the second category it found all of that and now it's putting into this master document and here it is here's our PDF the first this is the title that we gave if you go back here this the title and here is the first slide let me zoom into this a little bit more the first category was beverages top products top customers top employees so here are the top five products the quantity top five customers quantity top employees is the quantity and here are the charts so here you can see the monthly sales again we saw february 2014 was the highest saw the highest sales for beverages you can see who uh, which products were sold the most and which products brought in the most money in here and the cool thing is that it created for we didn't even see this category but it created uh, since we passed two it created a, another slide just for this so condiments, these all numbers for these condiments. And you'll see all of it is nicely aligned. This is nicely aligned. You have all these charts. I'm not too happy with the space between these two, but we can change that pretty easily. Uh, let's go back and change that, which was here. We go back to the child document and I know we have that one V space over here. So let's just make it two. Maybe make it three. Um, let's keep it two because I don't want it to mess mess it up. Let's knit it again. Okay, so it's better. It added a little bit more space here. So it looks much better, much cleaner. You can see how much white space we have everywhere. And you can change the font type and add other things that you want to see. So for condiments, looks like April of 2014 was the best month. Um, and veggie spread saw the most dollar value in terms of sales. So which is funny. So beverages bring in more money than condiments. Anyhow, so Another thing that you can do with that cable extra function is right now how you can see all these are 
just one after another, you can actually create alternating rows to make it look a little bit nicer. So let's do that kind of live action and rather than uh, using the pre-cooked code, let's cook it together. So I'm going to go to this child document and go to this link. And we want to see alternating rows. So let's just go here. Maybe it's up at the top. So you can see it does lots of different things. I'm not seeing it, so let's just say alternate. Okay, there was using uh, do, do, do. People usually call it to here I'm using bootstrapping. Ah, there it is. So LaTeX option equal to stripped or stripe. And once we do that, it should create, give us tables that has stripe rows so let's just go and add that right here and maybe we should make that change to every table and i know i have some repetition here but this is just an example because your data set might look different even here when i'm doing the same theme elements, I could create a function out of this and create my own theme and just pass that. Uh, we could save some time and uh, reduce the repetition, but your use case might be different because your charts might be different. Anyhow, so we made the change. Let's knit this again and see what happens. Uh-oh, it didn't like this argument. So this is where you go crazy but thankfully at least this is an R error and not LaTeX error. But it's saying error here, unused argument. Oh, it doesn't like that. So what did the PDF say? It's in cable styling. Oh, it's not in cable, that's the mistake. All right, so let's go back here and where is my table? Add it here. And let's continue and then remove this. Okay. So let's just select this. All right, let's try this again. Okay, this is not looking good. This is where I was trying to fix all the libraries making sure that uh, it, it is able to find my my libraries for LaTeX but it's not happy oh well we'll just comment this out and I don't want to spend time in trying to fix this one more all right so Make sure this runs again. All right, so it runs. Unfortunately, we were not able to add the alternate row colors, but there's some problem with my tech libraries. Otherwise, it would have done it and it would have looked different. Okay, we are getting to the end of this tutorial. And are you ready for the best part? Because we only did this for two categories and you might remember there were eight categories. And I have this for loop to go through each of those categories, this cat cat count data frame. 
and this for loop will go through each of those categories and create this child document or knit the child document and put it in the, into our final presentation document. So I'm going to uncomment that, make this or add a comment to that line and knit this and let's see what happens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and fingers crossed. And here it is. Now we have nine pages. Let's just make it bigger. And let's see what we have. And make this. So our title page, beverages. Here's the data for beverages. Here's the data for condiments. And now we have something new, confections, confections, March of 2014. Uh, this this didn't fit here because it looks like it had more scales 5,000 10,000 but that's something you can fix it and dairy products grains cereals uh, so this see here since these were longer it, uh, the bottom row got squished fortunately it still printed it but maybe we need to either rename these or add uh, increase the column width for this meat and poultry oh, this looks like a duplicate maybe the data is uh, not proper or maybe our calculation was wrong seafood but anyway here is the document nine pages one per slide and you can only imagine the power of this because you can make so many different changes you can have your own calculations as long as it fits in these nice grid formats you can create automated reports for anything and the power of this is you don't have to change your calculations again all you have to do is make sure your calculations are right the first time and once your database changes once your data set changes it gets refreshed it has more data all you have to do is just run the program again and it will, it will produce the report every month until the data actually breaks or your libraries break but that's the power of R because you can connect to data, you can reshape it, you can create nice looking reports. And another good thing about this is we added a lot of LaTeX specific code here, this, all this uh, LaTeX code. But if you just created a new Markdown document with a presentation format or an article format, the cool thing about that is you can actually export it to a PDF, a Word document, even a PowerPoint presentation. So it's it can be imported and exported to any format but I like PDF because it's highly scalable it looks nice you can make big uh, you, you can zoom it to a thousand and it will not lose the quality of it the graphs might start might, uh, might look a little bit different but the text will stay really nice so you can print it you can make small business cards if you wanted to or you can make nice handouts but that's why I love R because of the power again as i said you can connect to any database and we only connect it to sql lite but you can actually connect it to sql server excel files text files obviously but other databases as as well whichever are supported with this dbi package and i'm sure if you find other other drivers you can connect to those databases also so thank you so much for watching i hope this was useful if you have any questions please leave in, leave in the comments and i will try to do my best to respond and I will add all those links in the description and uh, the accompanying blog post so that uh, if I misspoke something, if you didn't understand what I was saying, then you'll be able to read it as well. Well, thank you again and good luck with your R Markdown projects.